I think one of the mistakes that we make in general in personal development and professional development and motivation and self-help is that we need to build this fucking amazing life and this amazing job and this amazing bank balance and, mm. and there's nothing wrong with any of that. But for me, most of the time, if something needs to change, it's not so much my situation, circumstance or environment as much as it is me yeah. in the middle of that. And so it's helping people because when, when I'm different, my world is different. Yeah. When I'm different, my life experience is different. Mm. I can be in a relatively shit situation and be the happiest guy ever, fulfilled, calm, curious, excited, but I'm not in an awesome situation. Conversely, I can be living in a palace looking at the ocean and I'm on three different medications for anxiety and depression and I hate my life and hate myself, right? So there's our, you know, the, this whole, uh, I guess, idea around how do I manage the totality of my existence, which is my external world and my internal world, because where I really live is here. Yes. I live here and I live here. Yes. And it's, it's trying to learn how do I manage my mind and my emotions so that wherever I am, I'm okay. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, what you're saying before about the pharmacy of the brain is so spot on, you know, like uh, anything that induces a neurochemical change is a form of medication, you know, like one thing I love to live by is the fact that the dog that we have is the best antidepressant I've ever had. Like I'm not depressed, but I'm just like filled with a sense of joy whenever I walk in and see, you know, the embodiment of unconditional love running at me. Um, so you, you spot on. I was interested. You said, um, you know, how do I manage? Can I say one thing about that? Can I yeah. say one thing? This is, e this is even more interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm like you. I love dogs. Yeah. So if we ever meet, I definitely want to lie on the floor with your dog, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But, but here's the thing. If your next door neighbour hates dogs, they're going to have the opposite reaction. Yeah. So it's not so much about the dog as it is your relationship to or feeling about or belief about dogs. It still comes from you. It's your response to the dog. I'm like yeah. you, mate. I love dogs. I reckon dogs are... Probably the best medication of all for most people. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think a lot of that, a lot of the reason why I love the dog is because I grew up with dogs. So it's very much, you know, it's very much ingrained in my subconscious that dog means good, dog means home, dog means family, you know, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you're talking about being able to manage your internal environment, um, how do you... Like, how, how does that look like for you? What does that come down to? A lot of people talk about, um, you know, Nietzsche said, you know, uh, he who has a why can bear almost any how. So uh, for him, mm. it was like a sense of purpose that enables you mm. to mediate life no matter how stressful it is externally. So um, what is it for you? That's a good question. So I guess for me, it's largely about self-awareness and. It, it's about recognizing, so in, in, this is very broad science, but in, in the science of self-awareness, it's often categorized in two areas. One is internal self-awareness, one is external self-awareness. So internal self-awareness is, you know, what's going on with me? What are my thoughts? Even, even what's my physiology doing? How do I feel? Uh, what's my self-talk? What are my ideas? Am I depressed? Am I happy? Am I... It's, it's kind of that internal awareness of where I am at mentally and emotionally is. Mm. But then there's another one which is, uh, it's called different things, but I was reading an article today, in fact, um, where, they, where it's called external self-awareness, which is having an awareness of what it's like being around me. So yeah. what's the Craig experience like for others? Um, what's the Tom experience like for others? And for me, um, it's very much about managing because I spend my life talking and coaching and teaching and all that. So it's a bit of both. It's about, I need to make sure that, <clears throat> that one, that I'm living, probably the most specific answer to your question is that I'm living my values, right? Yep. That's, that's when I'm in my best place. Yep. And what are my values? Honestly, my values these days are more about, you know, giving than getting. It's more, it sounds cliche, but it's about how can I serve others? I tried the yeah. getting rich and making money and 
buying fancy cars. I tried that. I did that. I did that model. And and I was, you know, wealthier than I should have been probably and wealthier than I thought I would be by the time I was 30. And I wasn't a schoolionaire, but I was very comfortable and very successful. I had five businesses and a hundred and a hundred staff when I was 30 years old, give or take. And life was good. But in the middle of all of that external success, which none of that's bad, but in the middle of all of that stuff, all of my picture of success, I was an overthinker. I was full of self-loathing, self-doubt, didn't love myself. Mm. And there was lots of shit going on because all of my focus was about essentially building this idea of success, right. this you know representation. And I think that sometimes... And by the way, in the middle of my, you know, and same with bodybuilding, I went down the bodybuilding route where all I wanted to do was be massive because I was insecure and get money and drive that and live there. And I did all that shit and I was still, all I was was a bigger, richer dickhead, you know, and in the middle, <laughs> right. that's all I was, right. you know, but, but it's because we're all flawed, we're all fearful, we're all insecure, we're all overthinkers and none of that is bad or terrible or weak. Mm. That is all human. Mm. And once you get through the bullshit and you go, okay, this is literally what I did when I was about maybe 35, so 20 years ago, I went, okay, I took 10 days out of my life, my very busy life. I went to Queensland. I didn't take a phone, a computer. I didn't talk to anyone for 10 days because I wanted to figure out what I wanted the rest of my life to look Mm. like. Because in the middle of my success, I felt very unsuccessful. Right. I was stressed and anxious and borderline depressed. And I thought, wow, I've done all these things that I was meant to do, apparently. And I've ticked these boxes and, you know, I've got these biceps and I own these, you know, I'm driving that and living there. And I I kind of knew that it wasn't, you know, of course I knew that that wasn't the panacea, but at the same time, the way that I lived and the way that I executed was lopsided and I needed to try and, as cliche as it sounds, go away and figure out what I wanted to be doing for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot of epiphanies and it's hard to find clarity and perspective when you're in the middle of mayhem. Yeah. So I often say to people, if your life or your body or your situation or whatever, your even your mindset is somewhat chaotic or not where you want it to be. And I know it's easier said than done, but we're talking about your life here. Yeah. Try and find even once or twice in your life, try and find even three days where you go away by yourself and you do not talk to another human. And you just think about, is this the trajectory I want to be on? What are my values? What matters to me? Does my behavior, my lifestyle, my results relationships, words, is it a reflection of what I really value? Mm. Or am I just living the program? Am I just on autopilot? Am I living unconsciously? Because living consciously, I believe, is where the joy happens. It's where we open the door to a different kind of wealth. So I do, you know, three years ago, in fact, I stopped coaching people for money because I felt guilty. I go. I don't want to charge. I, companies pay me lots to speak. I go, that's enough. Right. So I stopped co- coaching people for money because it didn't fit with my values. And I got so busy that I kept putting my hourly rate up to the point where I felt awkward, but they would still pay. I'm what? like, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know? And so I don't train, co- coach many people these days because I'm busy, but, but I still probably see three or four people a week but I don't charge anyone a cent because for me, and I'm not suggesting anyone else does that for me, that's what works. Yes. That's for me. That's what lines up. You know, I don't have a wife. I don't have kids. I'm okay. I don't need, I don't need more money. (laughs) I don't need more money. doesn't mean, you know, I don't have a business or I have a business. I have a full time PA slash business manager and all those normal things. But honest to God, my, my, my priority is top 20, money wouldn't be, money would be number 20 maybe. Yeah. It's a resource. And so for me, it's all about, it came down to, and I know I'm talking way too much, but it just <laughs> came back to trying to figure out who I was beyond all the things I thought I was meant to be. 